You've just stepped onto The Pedestal, where we talk everything entrepreneurship, growth, and support for women of color. I'm Lady. I'm Delise. And I'm Melissa, and we're excited to have you with us. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our first Spotlight episode. We are super jazzed to have Paula Pereira with us. Paula and I actually went to school together. We did completed our MBA um, between 2015 to 2017 together, and she's just really a phenomenal person. Um, She really was that kind of classmate that you wanted to work with all the time. You know, people were super excited to have her as part of their group. So uh, you can imagine my excitement when she agreed to um, chat with us today about everything that she's been doing. So I'm just going to give a quick intro um, about Paula and we'll dive right in. So uh, Paula is actually the owner of TOP Legal Management Services, where she provides training on immigration, operations and policy for legal service providers. Uh, Paula has actually practiced immigration immigration law exclusively uh, in the private practice, um, done policy for the federal government, and spent the bulk of her career in the nonprofit sector, providing legal services, overseeing national immigration programs, supervising, and training. Um, To me, that is a kind of superwoman type of profile that I know that I could not do. So uh, it's it's really a lot of fantastic stuff. So welcome. uh, Welcome to the episode, Paula. Hi, Delise. Thank you so much for having me uh, today. And it's so nice to meet you, Melissa and Lady. I I wish you guys the best in this podcast. Oh, thank thank you. you Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So, Paula, um, you want to tell us a little bit about your business? Sure. Um, Yeah. So, as Delise said, I am the founder and owner of TOP Legal Management Services. And this is um, a business where we train attorneys and legal service providers just to be the best possible version of themselves. And we do that through training on immigration law, which is what I focus on. Uh, we, we also teach them about operations, how to be efficient, how to deliver legal services, um, and also policy. As you guys know, immigration law is in the news all the time and policy changes and it can be overwhelming. So we try to keep them up to date on all these things. And we also try to put in some self-care because these are really stressful times and it's important for us to be um, as balanced as possible. Are, are you working directly with the public, for example, or with other um, organizations or other legal entities? So it honestly depends. Um, right now, I'm doing a lot of work with nonprofits, uh, which is why I say legal service providers, uh, because there is a, a demand from nonprofits. Uh, But once in a while, I do get private practitioners, attorneys who just want to really focus on specific areas. Uh, It just depends. The the services are are open just to anyone who practices law. So what was your your key driving force to become an entrepreneur? You know, why immigration law? Why this specific area? What drove you to that? So the funny thing is that when I was in law school, I didn't want to practice immigration law. I said, anything (laughs) but immigration law. And so... Here you go, right? This is what happens. It's the thing that you resist the most that you end up doing. Um, But, you know, I've been blessed. I've had a really great career as an immigration attorney, and it's opened up so many doors for me in so many different ways. Um, And so when I was in business school, you know, I was like, what do I do with myself? I don't know what to do with myself. I got to figure something out. Um, Do I leave immigration law? Do I stay with it? And I was like, well, I've always been entrepreneurial. I'm always like the attorney that says, oh, we need to upgrade IT. We need to figure this out. We need to figure that out. Let's do it better. And I was like, well, why don't I just go into business for myself uh, so I can teach others how to do these things and like point things out to them and just help them be better. Um, So that's how it all came to pass. Oh, wow. So so you were doing it. You were practicing privately um, immigration law before your business school. Yeah, I practiced so I I practiced like uh, 10 years before I went to business school. And then I was at a point in my career where I had a really cool job. You know, it was a really good salary. Things were going well. But I was like, I don't think I can do this for 20 years. I've got to figure something out of, you know, how do I make myself better? Um, Some people can. Right. And that's really awesome. And, And but that's not me. That's when it dawned on me. Let's go to business school. Let's talk to business people. Let's see how they do things. Um. 
you know, and, and, isn't, and that, awesome. isn't, that the, isn't that the thing that we hear often, right? When we talk to other entrepreneurs is that, that you, you kind of hear that, that where they go, like, I don't know that I can do this forever, you know, or like they're doing their nine to five and it just kind of hits them. Like, this is just not the thing that I, I, I can't see myself 20 years from now in the same position. So yeah. it's, it's always interesting to just hear every entrepreneur that we meet say the exact same thing. Like, it's just that forward looking you know, vision and they're like, ah, I can't do it. I have to do something else, you know? So that's interesting. Yeah. What challenges did you face as a uh, Hispanic Latin women starting your business? Cause I think that's one of the key things that we want to, you know, speak to, um, especially like uh, women of color. So, you know, Delisa and I were talking that we took, uh, we took a class about uh, entrepreneurial business and strategy when we were in business school and we had to do a feasibility study and so uh, part of my feasibility study was that I, I went to see like what other similarly situated companies were doing. Right. And it was all the same. Right. It was like older men uh, who were white, who ended up going to business school, but weren't lawyers. Like I had a hard time finding lawyers who did this type of work or lawyers who had a business, um, uh, what a business background. And then when I did find, I didn't find any that were Latina or very few mm. that were women. Um, it's always like a certain type of, um, you know, just other person who's doing it. Yeah. And I said, well, I bring a lot of diversity, not just like, you know, gender and ethnicity, but also like, look at all the different things that I've done. And no one has like the set like that. I haven't seen anyone come together with all that different skill set to try to work with others. Um, so, you know, I, for me, it was just about differentiating myself and just trying mm -hmm. to highlight like all the things that I bring, um, and that I can, um, just, you know, work with a, with a whole bunch of different people. Um, I mean, that's how I approached it. You, you actually were able to kind of take that challenge then and, and almost turn it into, um, something that worked as a, as, as, as a value proposition in your business you know, so to speak, like, you know, I'm, you're using the, the differences that you had um, of, of where that industry didn't have many um, Latina or Hispanic women in it. It was just dominated by men to your advantage, in other words. Yeah, I mean, that's that's what I, you know, that's what I've been trying to do. Um, and yeah. I have to tell you, that class was awesome because that class, like, <laughs> he was tough. He was tough. And he was like, you got to do it better. That's not going to work. And I'm like, <laughs> OK, so let's keep working on it. Let's keep refining right. it. Right. What That's if awesome. do you find like currently, even in your like in the work that you're doing right now, do you find that still true? Like, do you still see kind of a lot of white men still kind of forging the lead or do you see more um, women, more just people of color coming into the industry that you're in? Yeah. So, look, I so I think that technology is really good. And I think if you can embrace technology and embrace new ways of doing things, that opens up um, new platforms and new new markets. Um, I think that the truth is that some people are very much tied to an uh, like an old school way of doing things. So a lot of the times I just I do stuff on social media, I do stuff, uh, uh, you know, through like Facebook lives and things like that, so that I can get uh, just a younger, more diverse crowd. And I think they, they are open to it. Um, and I, again, I think that's one of the things that sets me apart. Um, and again, I just, I'm always trying to do things that are a little different. They're a little out of the box um, just to set me apart from other people that uh, might be starting out. I do see more competition now though. That's very <laughs> funny. I think in the last three years, a lot of people have been, um, I just see a lot more competition. Got right, it. Right, right, right. I guess competition yeah. is a good thing, right? So that just means that we're there's more of us out there <laughs> working. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. It keeps you on your toes. Yeah, exactly. The next question I wanted to ask was, you know, just looking through your um, you know, your social media, I noticed that, you know, self care self-care was really an important part of your service offering. You know, how does that play a part in with what you do with immigration and how you know, you provide this kind of training for other uh, legal services? You know, I think that's so key. I know that, you know, as attorneys, we're like trained to always just give, 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 uh, I, it, you know, like always to cater to our clients. Right. Uh, but I find that, you know, we're always stressed. Um, 
it's just a very stressful profession and it's just very hard to like unwind. And if I noticed it with myself um, and especially in immigration law, the last three years, the policies have been very, um, they've been very harsh and it's very hard to navigate. And I was like, well, if I need to unwind and I need to be at my best performance, then I know other people are in the same boat. And then I did some research, right? Because that's what you learn. You have to do your yeah. research and gather the data. And it's all there. You know, um, we have higher levels of depression and substance abuse than, than the mainstream uh, population. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I'm like, let me share what I'm doing because I know it's helping me. Um, and I know that, you know, little changes can make a big difference. Absolutely. And I mean, you always do hear, you know, like all the hours that, you know, uh, legal, the legal industry puts into it. So I can imagine that self-care is definitely such an important part. Do you ever get stories from some of your, you know, your colleagues or the, you know, the people you're training that say, wow, like, you know, the fact that you're adding self-care into your service offering is helping me or... So a lot of them are a little skeptical in the beginning. Okay. <laughs> They're, like, <laughs> <laughs> They're like, what this do you mean? This is new to them. They didn't even know. They didn't even think to, think to take care of themselves. They're like, wait, yeah. what are we talking about? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, and they're like, well, we don't have time for all of this. I just said, I'm like, just do one thing. <laughs> just one thing. That's all you need to do. So what's like one thing that like an example of a self-care that you recommend if you're able to share it? Sure. Um, so I started just recently, and I've never done it before, meditation. It, it's something that I've actually picked up during quarantine. Um, and it was only because someone forwarded me a link just as a, a kind gesture to like a free, a free event. Oh, and okay. I said, okay, I'll do it because, you know, I'm at home all the time. What am I going to do now? Yeah, and I yeah. started it and it was amazing. I mean, it's, I think it's really had a strong, like a, a very positive influence. And, you know, I've been blogging about it and just telling people about it. Um, you know, you don't have to go full out. Again, I, I tend to do things that are, I get the most bang for my buck. I really do believe in that. And mm-hmm. it's just, it's 10, 15 minutes a day, sometimes 20 minutes. I do it a few times a week. And like, I feel more energized, you know, because this quarantine has been really rough. Absolutely. And it, it affects like, like it was disrupting my sleep pattern. It, you know, I just, it was, I wasn't feeling really well. And then it's just made me feel so positive, so energized, uh, like, oh yeah, let me do this. Let me be productive. Let me get some, some content out. Um, and if it can do that for me, again, I share it, you know, I'm open about it. If it can do it for me, you know, just try it. It's free. You know, you won't get charged anything for it. Right. Um, <laughs> That's fantastic. Uh, that I, I really like that. And I, and I really like just, um, I'm, I'm kind of glad Lady had that question about asking about your the self care because I you know um, I, I think it's such a unique way to approach uh, the industry that you work in and, and make sure that you're actually not just providing training um, or or you know help, helping out those sort of nonprofits etc and 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 companies in legal services but also helping them be better service providers themselves um, I think it's fantastic. Um, you were, you were kind you were talking a little bit about leveraging social media, um, and, and trying to, you know, sort of separate yourself, um, from, from how the majority of the industry markets itself. So tell me, you know, if you want to dive in a little bit more about what tactics or how did you come about really, um, deciding to, to, to leverage social media and other mediums in a different way to, to market your business? So, you know, it, it all comes back to, to business school. I met all of you guys and I was like, you know, we're taking all these classes. Let's see how I can use the stuff that I'm doing in business school. Um, and I, I mean, I've always liked social media. I think that, you know, it's a great way to get information. Uh, it's a great way to spread ed- information and educate. And depending on the platform, you, you know, it's, it's a different audience. Um, and attorneys are always like, you know, cause we, we actually have a lot of attorneys have a lot of restrictions on how they can advertise. Right. Um, but if you do it in a certain way, it's still okay. Right. And so, you know, I was like, well, let me try it. Let me, let me see what I can do in different ways. I remember the first, when I was starting to use, uh, Instagram, I was telling a friend, I'm like, I don't get Instagram. So it's just, it's pictures. What, what do these pictures have to do with anything? <laughs> um, but, you know, you just you you can figure it out. You can take classes. You can see what other people are doing. Uh, but it's a great way to share stories. It's actually my preferred way to share stories and what I'm doing. 
mm-hmm. followed by my by my blog. I think those two are, are my my favorite ways. Um, and you actually get um, sort of do, do you do you sort of use them more just to get information out there and to be relevant and share content, or do you feel like you actually get sort of an uptick in in inquiries and and requests and so on from potential clients using them? People find me because they do Google searches and, you know, the keywords that they're putting in leads them to me. And I had someone tell me that uh, because she was she came out of, you know, she came out of left field out of the blue. And I was like, how did you find me? Do we know anyone? (laughs) Uh, And she's like, no, I just searched on the Internet. I searched on Google. Um, And so, you know, the keyword searches uh, brought her to me. Um, I got this lawyer. Like deliberate search engine optimization or you feel like you know, just the, the the combination of you constantly posting and blogging and using some of those keywords were actually popping you up at the top. It's organic. It's all organic. So I, I spend time looking up keywords. Uh, you know, I, I spend time playing with hashtags. Um, if you if you look at what I'm doing in Twitter now, uh, I have summer interns and, uh, you know, they're they're a handful. And so I'm using a hashtag summer interns just to talk about how I'm overseeing and managing and supervising. Right. Right. And how I'm dealing with the interns. Um, Like I'll do, you know, you have to have like a social media calendar. And then during certain times of the year, I'll focus on certain things. September happens to be citizenship month, citizenship day. So I'm like preparing Mm -hmm. all this content now to do for September. So then, um, you know, you were talking a little about a bit about the classes and then even in your journey, deciding, you know, looking down the road, you know, that you wanted to do something else or you wanted to, to venture into entrepreneurship. Um, one of the main questions, I think, are, are, are things that kind of handicap and, and prevent um, budding entrepreneurs from making that leap is asking the question about, does it pay the bills, right? Or am I going to be as lucrative as I, uh, you know, or am I going to have the same lifestyle I'm able to afford by working a nine to five or working in a corporate environment? So how has that leap been for you? Did you, did you find that you had to do full-time work and full-time start your business or did you just make the jump? Um, how, how was that leap for you? So I wanted to make the jump and then I saw how my bank account was a little low. Um, <laughs> so I had to really there. like, you, you know, think that out. Um, yeah. And I was lucky enough that, you know, I am lucky enough that legal work comes my way. Right. And that's, right. and that's the cash flow. Um, right. And that, you know, that'll cover the necessities. That's what I say. Yeah. Uh, but okay. it leaves me enough time open so I can work on the business. And it really is how much work you put into it. When I put a lot of work into it, I see the leads. I see people calling me. And then, right. the, you know, when I don't put a lot of work into it, it goes down. So you have to work on it like every day, all the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That, that is, that is, I, I really want to highlight that. And I think I might actually throw that into like our little spotlights that we have on, on Instagram where we will put in a little clip. I think that's so important for, for entrepreneurs and future entrepreneurs to hear is that you constantly hear about the work right? The, you have to put in the work or it's your business is not, you, you can't just like publish something and then, you know, Oh, I made a website. And then all of a sudden people will come like build it and they will come. It doesn't work. <laughs> out. You have to, you really have to put in the time you have to put in the energy. You have to, you know, get behind it for it to start really bringing you the return. So yeah. I'm, I'm just, I'm always glad to hear someone else kind of reiterate that. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think people think that build it, meant like all right building that's in a build it means work for it right like do the work right. day in and day out and then they will come so yeah yeah absolutely yeah. so um i have a couple of questions just you know i know you talked about like right now um you're specifically working for nonprofit organ working with nonprofit organizations you know how is running a successful business different than what you thought it would be and did you think you would work for, with nonprofit or did you think it was going to be more with private practices or you know how does how did how did you decide who you would be working with and how have you seen it you know change from what you thought it would be so, I mean, I think that's a great question because I think that it, it just, you have an idea in your head and sometimes it doesn't always go what you think and yeah. you have to be able to refine it. Um, when I did the feasibility study, I was like focusing on private attorneys. Uh, Cause you look, when we first graduated from law school, we've got this really fancy degree, <laughs> uh, but we're like, we really, it's called the practice of law. Cause you literally have to practice it <laughs> to actually know what you're doing. 
Um, and so I thought, yeah, like, you know, uh, people who are just graduating, uh, people who want to make a switch, who want to learn, who want to do all this stuff. I think that's my ideal target. Uh, but then I realized, you know, as I'm doing this, right, and people are calling and they're interested and they're asking me questions that I'm fielding all these questions from nonprofits mm. um, who have only one attorney, who have no attorney and want to hire an attorney, like what to look for. And then I realized, OK, well, this is real. So I know people in nonprofits because I ended up spending the bulk of my career there. So let me see what I can do with that. Um, and right now, that's really like um, the bulk of my business uh, because there are startup nonprofits in the same way that there are, you know, new attorneys and they need guidance, too. Yeah. Oh, that's great. So it kind of just like it evolved from what you thought. But, you know, it's been great for you. So that's really awesome to hear. Um, and then you're helping so many people. So that's that's great. And um, I know we talked a little bit about COVID and, and you mentioned the meditation as a self-care Um and that's like a positive thing I feel like that came out of the our COVID experience, our quarantine time right now. Um, did was there like a, a an impact in uh, in other ways to your business due to COVID? Yeah, the call stopped <laughs> all together. <laughs> oh, wow. So so the week that I that basically New York City shut down, I had. Uh, you know, events lined up, in-person training events in New York City lined up. Wow. Um, and all that got shut down. And wow. we had, like, we, you know, we were, we had a contract through the end of June, and all that got shut down. Wow. Wow. Some people said, yeah, 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 we'll call you back in April. <laughs> we'll figure it out in April. <laughs> um, so so that was, like, the, got rescheduled, like, for now, like, for the summertime? So I so I I think that's where we are now, but it took like three months, right? Three and a half months. Yeah. Um, so yeah. it yeah, everything shut down. People thought we were gonna go back really quickly. And then I just think, you know, the shock of it all, just just we weren't mm -hmm. prepared for it, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Um so but it's it's like it's the, like the calls are finally coming back, it's slowly building up again. I think people feel comfortable. Um we, we're learning to work from home. Yeah, uh, right. you know, yeah. it's remote working. I do a Facebook live on Fridays, on most Fridays, mm -hmm. and it's like working from home. How do you supervise staff? How do you, right. you know, supervise? Uh, how do you do your work from home when you're home all the time? Yeah. Um, and do you think you'll yeah, end up so, doing virtual trainings too? I'm sorry? Do you think you'll end up doing virtual trainings too? You know, just kind of, because I'm seeing a lot of, um, a lot of industries are kind of modifying to almost like because we were forced to work from home and use technology in such a heavy way to keep businesses going. Uh, you know, some, some, some companies have leveraged it even after things are starting to open up by saying, you know, we can just do a lot of this stuff virtually. So do you, do you think that's probably going to um, end up being a big portion of, of how you service your clients with virtual sessions, for example? I hope so, because I think it's doable. You know, some people because you can do it through like a video conferencing and you can still have that one on one or, you know, you can have uh, groups that way. I, you know, I'm always a positive thinker. I'm like, this is an opportunity. Let's try it out. Let's see if it works. Right. That's awesome. And that how about awesome. um? So, are, so you guys are getting prepared because, I mean, I feel like but like it seems like it's not going away. So are you guys getting prepared for potentially maybe in the fall for it to be another quarantine? So I am, I'm very, I've made my home as comfortable as I can. <laughs> uh, and I've done a lot of decorating during the quarantine too. And I'm, I'm like, I've redone my bedroom, which is where I have my desk. Right. <laughs> um, just cause I, I need like, again, the whole health self care, uh, uh, spa, like, uh, atmosphere. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm assuming it's going to be like this for a while because people just don't feel comfortable. I mean, part of the work that I do is like, um, sometimes like bigger set, like, you know, groups of people. Mm -hmm. And so you can't, you can't really do that right now. So I'm assuming. Um, well, so jumping into, uh, well, talking about COVID, um, and, you know, even even within the quarantine, you know, we've seen that there has been a re recent ruling on DACA. Um, maybe you could share a little bit of, you know, for our listeners who don't know what DACA is and also with the recent ruling, you know, what's next for the Dreamers? You know, is, does this mean the DACA program is safe or are there additional phases to go through? Just today, I actually saw that, you know, it seems like the Trump administration is going to be um, actually, send you know, like re resending uh, papers that 
I guess they may have been missing or something again to, to, you know, remove DACA altogether. Do you see that a lot in um, the not-for-profit organizations that you're working with? Like, do they focus on that? Yeah. So we've been following DACA, you know, the DACA litigation for a while and, we knew that there would be a decision coming from the Supreme Court sometime in June um, on it. You know, it's a great program. It was started by President Obama to help uh, people who came here when they were young um, and had completed at least a high school education to get like some type of temp- um, quasi temporary legal status. And it's an awesome program. I've been very fortunate that I've been able to help a lot of DACA people, uh, you know, through clients. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think they're, they're an awesome population. Um, you know, you, you would, sometimes you wouldn't even know that they're not American because they've grown mm-hmm. up here. They've lived here their entire lives. You know, we've gone to school with them and, and just you don't have any idea of like the limitations they've had. So it's an awesome program. The Supreme Court ruled that the program can continue. Um, obviously this president, this president, this administration has other thoughts on it, uh, and he may try to overturn it. Uh, but that will have to go through the courts as well. Uh, Mm -hmm. but in the meantime, at least for the next few months, we continue to file renewals and we continue to, you know, there are two year work permits and they can have like really a normal life, um, and it's always important that if you are working with a dreamer, someone who has DACA, that, you know, as a lawyer, that you screen them for other immigration benefits, because sometimes they can apply for a permanent status okay. um, and they just don't realize it. Um, so it's a, it's one of my favorite types of cases to do. Yeah, because I mean, I hear, you know, they work so hard, you know, right? Like they're they're working so hard to have the college degrees, the the high school degrees. And then, um, and then this has been their home this whole time. And to hear that, you know, it's be, trying to be overturned and what, what would happen to them, you know, like if they go back to their, you know, home country with not actually ever really living there, you know, so it's interesting. Yeah. It's our, 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 our people like new, our new applications uh, being taken or, or are they only doing renewals at this time? So that's the thing that we're, we're kind of unsure. We think that the decision allows to do new applications. But what happens is that the Immigration Service, USCIS, uh, has to give us instructions. Um, and they haven't released the instructions. So, mm-hmm. you know, some I mean, some, I haven't done any new ones, but... Some attorneys, I think, are waiting because if they send a new application, it could get rejected. Um, So that's that's the unclear part. But, you know, I hope we clear. I hope I hope we get we get clarity on that soon so we know how to proceed. Are you still taking new clients, I guess? Well, yeah, I mean, I still do legal work, right? Um, I don't do a lot because I'm not full time anymore doing legal work, but I still do legal work. I think it's important, especially if you're going to like train on these issues um, just to stay up to date because there's so much going on. Um, And I still do a lot of volunteer work um, with like uh, legal organizations. Awesome. 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 All right. So on, on that, um, you know, given that, you know, you you do some of the legal work just to keep yourself up to speed, but you're really, really focusing on um, that entrepreneurship side of it and, and, and the business that you're building for yourself. What, what, what kind of advice um, would you give to someone who wants to become an entrepreneur? It's like really thinking about making that leap. I mean, I think they, I think they should do it, right? Um, I thought about like doing something on my own for a very long time. I just didn't quite know exactly what it would be. I think part of it is because I was, you know, worried that uh, I wouldn't be able to, you know, pay the bills, as you said. Um but I, I think you should try it. Uh, you know, if you want to do it as a side hustle while you still work your full time job and if you can do that, do that, build it up. Um, I think, you know, there's the freedom that comes with entrepreneurship. There's a the satisfaction that you're creating this, you know, on your own for others. Um, you know, the, the dream of being your own boss. Um, it's, you know, I I like it. Um, I I'm glad that I went to business school. That worked for me. You don't have to go to business school, but you know, if you need to take a course just to learn something, whether it's uh, you know social media strategy, 
entrepreneurial skills. Do it if that makes you feel better. Read some books if that makes you feel better, but do it because I think it's worth it. I think it's um, it's like something inside of you that needs to get out. And the moment it's out, you're like, oh, this is cool. This is what I was supposed to do. That's amazing. That's amazing. Thank you for that. Uh, we just wanted to know if there was um, like a memorable or impactful case that you had to deal with that you could share with us. Uh, yeah, I was thinking about that. I was like, what do I, what do I, what, what can I share? I'll tell you one that happened like during business school. And it was right before our accounting final release of all oh time, right? Wow. I know, yeah. I know. And that was, that was an intense class. That was an intense class. So that's first yeah. semester. And I was oh, yeah. uh, representing these, uh, this couple. It was a gay marriage case. The U.S. citizen is a lot older than the spouse, than the than the foreign spouse. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I had we had started the case and it took a while to get to interview. And I was like, maybe you guys can go on your own. I'm kind of busy studying for finals. Um, <laughs> but, but I was like, no, no, relax. I was like, I can do it. I'll go with you guys. There were like a few things that I wanted to make sure like didn't get like, you know, make the, the case more complicated than it was. And we went and it went so smooth, like so smooth. And the, the U.S. citizen spouse, after it was done, just looked at me and said, that's it. Um, and I was like, yeah, I guess we're done. You know, your husband will get the green card in the mail and you're all good. Um, and then, you know, I'm taking the train back back into uh, back to school. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm in the train is empty and I'm like, oh, my God, what am I going to do? I'm never going to be able to leave this field. <laughs> um, I've got to figure something out. <laughs> um, and I think I think that was like the deciding thing that pushed me into like training and operations. I'm like, if I can do this and I can make someone feel this good, like a client, then why can't I teach other attorneys or work with other attorneys so that mm -hmm. it can so that they can have the same results? Yeah. So it was memorable kind of also be because of the, the success of it, but then also because it was a turning point for you as well in, in when you're making that, that decision. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. 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 So kind of in that spirit of memorable and what about recently um, with TOP legal management services, you know, what has been your most satisfying moment in business? You know, it could be anything from getting a new client or your first client or, you know, just, what, what has been your most satisfying? I think for that, it was that, uh, again, out of nowhere, like this particular person, like this particular organization found me. Um, and I lucked out because like they're a big organization and that we've been work working together now for, I think, almost two years. Oh, wow. um, and they constantly keep renewing the contract. Uh, you know, they because it's a nonprofit, they work uh, on grants and they have to get their grants renewed to be able to subcontract out the training. But it just I was like, how did you guys find me? And it, it wasn't like they, you know, it wasn't like it was a, a warm handoff. It was literally like them searching stuff online, reviewed some of my materials and said, you know, let's talk to her. Let's see if she's the right person. And they were talking to other people. Right. It just wasn't me. Um, yeah. And they picked me. And that was pretty awesome. That's awesome. fantastic. That is fantastic. Um, I actually want to ask one more too from um, our, our B list of questions here. Um, I think it's important, um, and, and a lot of budding entrepreneurs would want to find out is how do you how do you build that credibility quickly, right? So you're, you're you know a lot of again it's that same kind of tone of it's not just build it and they would come, but you know a lot of new entrepreneurs are always nervous, like you know feeling like they're a fraud or they just started and they don't know really what they're doing. So how do you build that credibility and trust for you, for your customers to want to go with you and to want to actually pay you money to, to provide the service that you say you can provide? That's a, that's also a really good question. Um, I, I end up, what ends up happening is that I end up engaging in a lot of conversations um, and, and just talking to people, talking to them, talking to them about myself, like what I do um, the social media, like once they talk to me, they'll look for me on LinkedIn. They'll look for the blog. They'll read the stuff out there. Um, and then, you know, they'll compare it to others. Um, it's just, I, I think you just constantly have to be out. Um, I also do like, I, I try to work with like different audiences. So sometimes professional associations like uh, lawyers associations, 
um, just like doing volunteer work and meeting with them. It's just you have to you have to be able to be in different places at once um, and show your face like different different facets of what you do. Right. Right. Uh, I don't I don't pretend that I am the uh, the most knowledgeable person on immigration law, but I can tell you that I can break things down simply. I can make it you know, into simple terms. Um, I like to share stories. That's how we teach people. Um, and, you know, that's what works for me. Um, and I use that approach when I'm talking to, to everyone. That's awesome. And, and you hear that often too, right? It's just networking and putting yourself out there. And I think, um, you know, they talk about that often when you're starting a business is to make sure you continue to establish yourself as, as, as um, not, not necessarily an expert, but somebody that, that knows about topics. So you're going to start a fabric business um, or, you know, you're going to sell fabrics or something. You, 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 should, you should write a blog about it or you should talk about different materials and why they're good for certain things and things like that. And just connecting and maybe connecting with uh, people that provide the fabrics that you want to sell and, and show yourself um, sort of interacting with those. So I think that's, that's really fantastic advice about, you know, making sure that you're not just showing up for your business, but showing up for the industry that you're in, in order to build that credibility. That's fantastic. Yeah. I think that's why like, you know, there's so much conversation about, you know, making sure that you put content out there because um, people want to see, you know, what your thoughts are on, you know, certain topics. So, and, and learn from you as well. So that's awesome. That is pretty awesome. Um, so Paula, where, where, what is the best way to contact you? What are, where should people look for you the most? Okay. So yeah, I mean, definitely on social media, uh, P Forero NYC. So P F O R E R O N Y C that handle will take you to my Facebook page, my Twitter and my Instagram. Um, and if you want, you know, you can DM me there or you can send me also an email to Paula at toplegalmanagement.com um, and go to my website, toplegalmanagement.com and sign up for my newsletter. Awesome. I've got you covered. You just have to sign up for one thing. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Um, we, you know, this, this was absolutely fantastic. I think it was, um, the, the right choice on our end for our first, uh, spotlight here. Um, I had such a blast myself chatting with you and I'm sure, uh, Lady and Melissa did as well. So absolutely. I really, really want to extend our thanks for, to you for spending time, uh, to chat with us for spending time through our technical difficulties as well, um, <laughs> getting this all set up, but I really, really appreciate your insights and, and we wish you all the success, um, moving forward. We're just, uh, with TOP management and everything that you're doing, uh, we're definitely going to be closely following, uh, what you're doing as well. Well, I've had a great time as well. Um, I wish you guys a lot of success. I think this is a great platform. I think to, to share different stories and to highlight, you know, and elevate, um, entrepreneurs. Um, sometimes it's a lonely world, but it's really great when you meet, meet like-minded people and you get to work together. Absolutely. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you coming on. Thanks for listening. For upcoming events, spotlights, and everything in between, find us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube.